welcome to another episode of Headline Canada. Today we have with us Ontario's Transportation Minister Honorable Stephen Deltuca. He is also representing the riding of Vaughan as a member of Provincial Parliament. Hello Minister, very warm welcome to PTC Punjabi. Thank you so much for having me on. Pleasure. Uh, let's begin our conversation with the recent announcement you made in Toronto about expanding bike share Toronto system. Yeah. So what is the motive of the plan? So we announced a number of months ago that we would make uh, a really large amount of money available to all of our municipal partners that have an interest in investing in cycling infrastructure. And back then, a few months ago, we said that we would make $42.5 million available this year to support municipalities building more safe cycling infrastructure because we know that 70% of Ontarians would consider choosing to use a bike regularly or on an occasional basis if they felt they could do so safely. So we made that money available. Today, we announced that every single one, to, one of the communities, 120 communities in total, yes. that applied for the funding would be receiving the funding because we've more than doubled the amount of money that we're making available. So instead of 42.5, this morning we announced $93 million will be made available thanks to our cap and trade program, thanks to our ambitious climate change action plan, we're making this available. What does that mean for Toronto? It means here in Toronto, more than $25 million will be made available by the province to help Toronto expand bike share uh, and build more cycling infrastructure here in this growing community, which is fantastic news, not only for cyclists, but for all road users, because it will help people get from point A to point B more safely. Definitely, that's a great news and uh, Minister, moving forward, uh, we know that for the first time the commuters will experience uh, the ex sub-extension from Downsview to Warren and it's, yes. it's the first time in 15 years and the first time that it is coming to York Region. That's right. First time in 15 years since there's been a brand new subway extension opening. The last one was the Shepherd subway back in about 2003. But as you mentioned a second ago, and you're 100% right when you say that this is the first time that we'll be opening up a subway extension in 15 years. But I also keep telling people, I've lived my entire life in the greater Toronto and Hamilton area. And I keep calling this the single most important public transit achievement of my lifetime because, as you said, for the first time ever, we will have a subway link to York University. Yes. And for the first time ever, we'll have the subway leave the 416 and go out into the 905, in this case up to York Region, up to Vaughan, which is great news, but it clearly demonstrates that all levels of government, led by the province, understand that gridlock and investing in transit and transportation is not just about Toronto versus the 905, it's about all of us being part of the same region and finding a way to come up with regional solutions for the regional problem that we have. Absolutely. This is a great initiative taken by your ministry and the government as well. Uh, but talking about uh, the, jo the jobs, so uh, during the construction time, how many jobs did, did um, this project create and how many jobs it's going to create once it is opened? Yeah, so that is a great point. We know every single time we make an investment in transit infrastructure, there are skilled tradespeople, skilled women and men who go to work on a regular basis because of those investments. And then we know from the operators of the transit system to everybody else who works throughout that entire sort of chain uh, within the sector that there will also be uh, additional employment opportunities. For the Spadina subway extension, there, I know there were several, there were hundreds and hundreds, I can't remember the exact figure right now, of people who were employed as a result of the construction, but anyone in this region who's driven anywhere near the different stations, at Jane and Highway 7, Jane and the 407, Keel and Finch, for example, right at York University, on a regular basis, you would see with the hard hats and the work boots, you'd see architects, engineers, skilled tradespeople, everybody working together to make sure that we get this line open. And it will be open this coming Sunday, December the 17th. So in less than two weeks, we're just about two weeks away, a little bit less than two weeks, yeah. two weeks yesterday yes. uh, from the official opening of the subway. And it's such a thrilling time for, for transit users and commuters here in the GTHA. Yes, there's no doubt that uh, this is a great news for commuters and they will definitely enjoy it. Uh, apart from this, talking about the opposition, the, the conservative leader Patrick Brown says that the uh, commuters, the, the people deserve more subway extension and he would uh, invest $5 billion only on the subway extension and especially for the Sp Scarborough subway extension, he's going to spend $3.3 .3 billion. So, there's a couple of really big challenges that I think the people of Ontario face with Patrick Brown's plan. I've, I've had a chance to review his plan. And the one thing that he doesn't like telling people is that on page 76 of his plan, 
he actually admits that he would have to find $12.75 billion, that's billion with a B, almost $13 billion worth of cuts in order to actually make the rest of the numbers in his plan add up. So having lived here in this region my whole life, I know, I know from history, I know from past experience, that when a conservative leader tells the people he'll invest in more things, but don't worry about what he has to cut, he'll figure that out later. Well, I know that's a bit of a trap door for people in this region, and particularly in transit and transportation, because the last time the Conservatives were in power, when Mike Harris was the Premier, they took the Eglinton subway. That was a project that had started. It was under construction. They stopped it. They killed it. And then they filled in the holes that had already been dug to build the subways. 20 years later now, now our government is building the Eglinton Crosstown LRT through the middle of Toronto. Yes. But imagine 20 years ago, if a Conservative leader hadn't cancelled that project, we'd have a subway operating. And why did Mike Harris cancel that 20 years ago? Because he knew that he just needed to get into office. He had to promise the voters everything they wanted to hear. But when he finally had control here at Queen's Park, he could make whatever decision he wanted to. We can't afford to fall into that trap again. And that's not the only example. We also know that conservatives like to privatize and like to move in the direction of selling off important transportation assets. I think every one of your viewers remembers well that Highway 407 was owned by the people of Toronto, owned by the people of Ontario, and a former conservative leader, Mike Harris again, decided to sell the 407 to a Spanish company after tolls had been put on it, and people who drive around this region have been paying for that, uh, paying for that disastrous decision for an entire generation. So, we as a government are investing in transit projects in every corner of the GTHA. The LRT on Cro the Crosstown LRT I mentioned a second ago, the Finch West LRT, we were the first level of government to provide funding for the Scarborough subway extension. Our funding yes. is still in place. The Huron Ontario LRT in Hamilton, sorry, in, in uh, Mississauga, and the Hamilton LRT, of course, in Hamilton. In addition to that, we're investing in GO Regional Express Rail. Right now, as we speak, we're building so that we will have two-way, all-day GO service, and the trains will be electrified on our pretty much our entire GO network. We run 1,500 trips per week right now on GO. In the next yes. six or seven years, that number is going to go from 1,500 up to 6,000. It's going to quadruple. So our plan is actually working. Patrick Brown, Patrick Brown cannot be trusted because his numbers don't add up. But more importantly, he wants the people of this region to have a big argument over who owns what and who's responsible for what. Do you know, as an Ontario Liberal, what I want to do as Ontario's Minister of Transportation, I just want to build. I just want to build more subways, and I want to build more, more LRTs, and I want to build GO Regional Express Rail. Because the people that I'm proud to represent in Vaughan and elsewhere across this region, they just want more transit options. They just really want all of us to stop fighting and stop arguing, get those shovels in the ground, and actually produce positive outcomes for them and for their families. Yes, I would like to add here that recently there were two highway lanes added to 410. Yes, so, but, that's but, right. But still, in the evening, if, if we look at the GTA traffic, people still um, face a lot of heavy traffic, the they commuters. Do. They do. So what next the government plans to do? So we, so we, we opened the two lanes on the 410. You're 100% right. We're still doing more construction work on the 410 because by this time next year, we'll open up an additional two lanes. So the original six lanes of the 410 will become 10 lanes in total. Right now, we're widening 427 through Etobicoke near the airport. Yes. That's going to be extended. So right now, Highway 427 ends at Highway 7. Our government will have shovels in the ground in 2018 to extend Highway 427 all the way up to Major Mackenzie Drive. That's roughly an 11 kilometer project, so that's going to help in that part of the region. We're currently building Highway 407 East, so the section of the 407, we opened the first phase earlier this year. We're going to open up a new phase of the second half of that in just a couple of weeks. That highway will be complete by 2020, and that's going to run all the way out to the 115.35 close to Peterborough. The other thing that's really important to remember about the 407 East, which our government is building, we're not selling that part of the 407 to anybody. That section of the 407, which is told, will remain in public hands and be owned by the people of Ontario forever and ever, as it should be, as that important transportation public asset 
should be. So those are just some examples. We're also widening the 401, a major project between yes. Mississauga out to Milton. When you go further south in the Cambridge area, we're currently widening the 401 there. And in York Region, uh, Highway uh, 400, from Major Mackenzie Drive up to the King Vaughan Line and ultimately beyond that, we're also widening there. So there really doesn't matter where you go in the GTHA, virtually every single one of our major 400 series highways is being widened or being extended because of our government's investments. I know it's tough for people to be patient. I commute in this region every single day of my life, so I know firsthand exactly what the challenge is, but we do have those shovels in the ground and we are putting skilled tradespeople to work and we are ultimately building the transportation and transit network that we need in this region. Definitely, and we look forward to it. We'll continue our chat right here, but right after a short break. Welcome back after the break. We have with us the Minister of Transportation, Honorable Stephen Del Duca. Uh, Minister, we would like to know that as uh, we have seen that Ontario government is always pro promoting the electric vehicle sale. Uh, but as per the, the survey, last year, 2016, the sales were only 1%. Yeah, so we, we made a decision a number of years ago that we were, would provide support to consumers who wanted to look at buying electric vehicles. So we have a couple of different programs. One is called the Electric Vehicle Incentive Program, and the other one more recently that we created was to help build charging infrastructure so that if you wanted to buy or lease an electric vehicle and you had to drive more than just a few kilometers, you'd be able to recharge your car at some point, like you can at a gas station with a traditional car, and not have any anxiety about whether or not you could get home again, because at the end of the day, that's one of the biggest stumbling blocks for people. Yes. If I'm out and about and I need to recharge and I don't have a place to plug my car in, will I be stranded? Will I be stuck? So here's what I would tell you, and I should also tell you, I'm also an owner of an electric vehicle. Just a few months ago, my wife and I made a decision to buy an electric vehicle, and we love it. For the last number of months, I can't tell you how satisfying it is. I haven't been to a gas station except to get a car wash for months now. And when I think about when we plug in our vehicle overnight, we, we are using electricity when it's at its cheapest rate because it's an off-peak time. And when I compare how much we're spending personally in our household on electricity to charge that car versus what we used to spend on gasoline, we're getting a much, much better deal as consumers because we decided to go with an electric vehicle. I will say the Ministry of Transportation has noticed through all of the analysis that we've done that while we started off with a relatively small number of vehicles that people were buying or leasing, the numbers are actually growing dramatically. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. Number one, more and more Ontario families want to do their part to help in the fight against climate change. Whether we're talking about how Lake Ontario flooded this year, or we're talking about the droughts that we saw here in the province the year before, more and more Ontarians, particularly younger Ontarians, realize that in order for them to have not only a bright future, but a reasonable future, we need to make sure that we are collectively doing our best to fight and ultimately win against climate change. That's number one. Secondly, there are more and more vehicles on the roads now. A few years ago, electric vehicles, there was only a small number and they were very expensive. It was very hard for the average family, the average middle class family in Ontario to be able to purchase or lease one of those cars. Now we see more and more vehicles on the roads that are in that lower price, in that lower price point, which means that when you factor in our, our incentive, which can be up to $14,000 in a rebate on some of these cars, when you take a lower price and then you factor in the incentive rebate that we provide, it actually makes a lot of these vehicles, a lot more of these vehicles, a lot more affordable for middle class families. So we're seeing more and more people make this choice and we expect with more products coming on the market being more affordable, plus our incentive program. We actually expect the numbers will continue to increase and will jump considerably over the next few years. So we've set some very ambitious targets in our climate change action plan by 2020. I can't guarantee that we will hit those targets, but I know we will be close and I know the numbers continue to grow and they're growing in a big way, which is good news for the economy and it's also really good news for our environment. Mr. we'll definitely uh, talk about the climate change, but before that, uh, we would like to know, as we know that the go government is hoping uh, to increase the electric vehicle sales by 2020 up to 5%, but as per the auto industry analyst, he says that the vehicle, electric vehicle sales is not just low, they're zero. No, I mean, we're actually seeing pretty explosive growth in this sector. 
Uh, there are thousands and thousands, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10,000 registered electric vehicles on our roads right now, and we're seeing the numbers grow. In fact, if you look at our incentive program, it's actually, I would say it's actually oversubscribed right now. There's been such tremendous interest on the part of the public to purchase or lease one of these vehicles. The growth rate that we see in the incentive program is, is actually quite high, and we're working with a lot of our car dealers and some of the others to make sure that we're providing the incentive back to them, the rebate back to them as quickly as we possibly can. So I would say the numbers are strong, they are getting stronger, and they'll continue to grow over time as more and more people realize that you can buy or lease one of these cars and then you can recharge it. Maybe you can recharge it at a local Ikea or a local coffee shop or a community center. Or in my case, my wife and I made the decision to invest in a home-based charging system and our government gives you a rebate back on the home-based charging yes. infrastructure of up to $1,000. So since I got the car and since we installed this home-based charging infrastructure in our garage, I haven't had to charge the car anywhere else except at home overnight one or two times a week. And I think more and more people are realizing as we promote this and as our partners uh, promote this, more and more people are realizing they can have a great vehicle, it's a safe vehicle, it can get them where they need to go, they don't have to worry about being stranded because we have a charging network in place, and they're helping us do their part to fight climate change. Coming to climate change now, how the government is going to address the climate change issue and the air pollution control? So we announced a number of months ago that we were going to have a very ambitious climate change action plan, and the, the foundation of the action plan is the cap and trade system. We've now had uh, more than one auction for our cap and trade system, and quite a bit of revenue has been generated on the auctions that we've done. The cycling money that you and I talked about just a few minutes ago, that's money, that $93 million that's coming out of our climate change action plan, that's coming from cap and trade revenue. That's money that we're putting back into the economy, back into communities to build cycling infrastructure because we know, of course, if somebody takes their bike to work and they leave their car at home, that's helping reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that's helping to reduce air pollution, which is the objective with all of this. Whether we're talking about investing in transit, whether we're talking about investing in cycling infrastructure, whether we're talking about our schools and making them, retrofitting them so that they're more, um, so that they're more GHG friendly, so that we reduce the emissions coming out of those buildings. All of these and so much more uh, are, are examples of how our government is helping the people of Ontario make decisions that are good for them and good for their pocketbooks, but again, also help us collaborate and work together on fighting climate change, and it's working. Yes, uh, Minister, as we all know that 2018 is a provincial election time. Yes. So what will the government do to lead the fifth straight victory and why people should vote, vote Liberals again? Well, so I think everybody in the province of Ontario knows very clearly where the Ontario Liberal government stands. We're fighting for them. We're on the side of the people. And we're on the side of fairness. So when I think about my own parents who came to this country many years ago, my dad from Italy, my mother from Scotland, and I think about the life that they built here in this country, in this province, the opportunities that they had, opportunities they gave, they gave to me and to my brothers and my sister, opportunities that my wife and I are now trying to pass on to our kids. I know that we want, we want a province that believes in fairness. So starting in January, as an example, every single Ontarian who's 25 years of age or younger will have free pharmaceutical medications. Starting this past September, nearly a quarter of a million college and university students are now attending college or university at no cost with respect to their tuition. A quarter of a million. Tens and tens of thousands of young Ontarians who really just want to be the best possible people that they can be, but we're being held back because of financial circumstances. We've eliminated those barriers and given them the opportunity to become the best that they can possibly be. I talked earlier about fairness. You think about it. One of the most important things for a person, I would argue, is that if they're going to do an honest day's work, they deserve an honest day's pay. Our decision to increase the minimum wage over the next two years, bringing it up to $15 an hour, means that thousands and thousands of Ontarians who work hard, play by the rules, pay their bills, will get a boost. And that boost for them personally will ultimately help our economy. And here's the other thing to remember about the province of Ontario. We have one of the strongest economies right now, not just in Canada, but right across North America. We've seen an unemployment rate just last Friday, an unemployment rate that here in the province of Ontario is now at the lowest it's been in 17 years. 
And when you think of all of the jobs that have been created in this province over the last seven or eight years, hundreds of thousands, almost all of them private sector, full time, and pay well. So the economy is strong. The investments that we're making in healthcare, in education, in transit and transportation, and in so much else, our decision to work really hard and work collectively to make sure we have a clean environment, and fundamentally, our pursuit of making sure that everybody has fair access to an opportunity. That's really the Ontario way. It's really the Canadian way when you think about it. And only the Ontario Liberal government is offering that kind of progressive agenda. And I believe that when the people of the GTHA and the people of Ontario have a chance to look at what we are producing and have produced for them versus what the two alternatives will be talking about, I have, I have a strong sense of optimism that they'll choose a brighter future and a more fair future for themselves and their kids and that the Ontario Liberal government will be re-elected in June of 2018. Absolutely. We look forward to it. So we all know that this is a festive season. What message you have for our viewers? I would, I would just say to uh, everybody watching, thank you so much for having me on today. And I want to wish everybody all the very best for the holiday season and also all the very best for a happy, healthy and prosperous new year. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. It was really a pleasure talking to you, pleasure interviewing you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you.